Thank you, Cindy. It was a number of years ago. Uh, in fact, uh, how I like to measure time, it was four children ago. Um, Caroline and I had not been married that long, and uh, a friend of ours came over to our house to talk with us. And what he wanted to do was to inform us that uh, he had begun to date someone. And uh, the someone that he was beginning to date is someone that uh, both Caroline and I knew. In fact, I had known her all of, of her life. And he was going to the trouble to come personally tell us about this because th th their difference in age was 12 years. And in truth, he didn't need my approval. He didn't need Caroline's approval. And uh, to their credit, uh, things uh, worked out. They, they dated. They got engaged. They got married. They've been happily married for years now. They've got two kids. But anyway, as he's telling me this, and, and as the conversation begins to unfold, and I can tell which direction this is going, uh, there's a part of me that's like, holy cow, I, I can't believe this. And, and, and I'm really shocked because uh, this young lady that he's beginning to date at this point, I remember holding her when she was a baby when I was 13 years old. It's a little strange. One of my friends now is, is dating her. And I don't remember much of what I said. I do remember saying this. I said, you know, if things work out, though, and you guys get married, at least you'll have a nurse when you're old. <laughs> Ever the encourager. <clears throat> But when I think back to that day and the conversation, uh, there's, there's one thing that I, I still to this day kind of smirk about. And that is that when he was talking to us and uh, explaining what, what it was that uh, was going on in terms of their relationship, one of the things he said was this. You know, technically we are um, a little over 12 years apart. He said, but I, I was born two months premature, so it's actually a little bit less than that. <laughs> say, say, <laughs> I can't even say it with a straight face. Say, say that again. You were two months premature. When did we start numbering time based on our due date? You know, my birthday's February 18th, but, you know, I was technically due three weeks. Anyway, so even to this day, I find that kind of funny, though. And in terms of description, we call a statement such as that, or we have a term for an argument such as that, and we generally reference it as grasping at straws, right? Grasping at straws. That's a statement that was first used in English back in 1534. A guy named Thomas More is the first to have uh, at least written it and is credited as having coined it. And it, it, it makes sense how the, the statement came to be because he used it to describe a person who is drowning. And so you've got this person who is in water that's over their head. They're getting ready to, gr to go down. And they are literally grasping at anything that is floating, even if that straw floating on the water, even if it will not help them. Because it's floating, they're going to try to grab it with the hope that it might yield them some sort of help. Grasping at straws. You know, each of us, throughout the course of our experience thus far, have been in conversations where we were grasping at straws. But you've also, in all likelihood, if you've been living long enough, you have engaged in it when the stakes are much higher than conversation. More specifically, not simply as a person, but as someone who professes to follow Christ. You and I can get to the point and place where because of decisions and choices that we have made, we wind up experiencing difficult and adverse circumstances. And when we get to those points and we get to those places and when our back is really against the wall, we very much are grasping at straws. We'll go after anything because the circumstances stink so bad, the pain is so real, the grief is so intense, the weight of the burden is so overpowering. We will do anything that we possibly can. We will reach out for anything that's remotely available because we want those circumstances to change. We want to find the escape hatch. We want to find the exit door. So too many times, even as followers of Christ, we find ourselves grasping at straws. This morning, we're going to 
conclude a series of messages that we began a number of weeks ago as we've been walking through the life of this Old Testament hero, a guy named Samuel. The series has been called Consistent, and we've called it that because Samuel serves and has served throughout the course of recorded biblical history as an example of what a consistent follower of God looks like. And today as we wind this down, we're going to see an example of someone who absolutely in their circumstances was grasping at straws. We're going to see Samuel's response to that, but hopefully in the process, discover some lessons that if we pay attention to them, are going to have a significant and marked impact on our lives and our own walk with God. Look with me, if you will, in your Bibles to 1 Samuel 28. 1 Samuel chapter 28. I know your Bible say, or excuse me, your bulletin says 25. That I put that in there wrong. It's actually 1 Samuel chapter 28. And we're going to pick up here in just a few minutes with verse 3. 1 Samuel chapter 28. <clears throat> Let me set the stage for you. When last we left Samuel, he's old. He's in the winter years of life. And God has just used him to anoint a young man named David who is going to be Israel's second king. In truth, and you remember, Israel should not have had a second king anointed so soon. But the reason for this is because Israel's first king, a guy named Saul, has decided, you know what, I can obey what I want, when I want, however I want from God. And God's going to somehow still be okay with that. He's going to find that to be a, a, a palatable response for me. And what Saul discovered is that God was not okay with that from him. And quite frankly, he's not okay with it from me or from you. And because of Saul's choices, God has brought circumstances to bear, the most costly or significant of which is that Saul's reign is going to be brought to an end. And he, God had great and huge and wonderful plans for Saul, for his, for his kingdom, for his reign. But all of that, because of Saul's choices, has been forfeited. David has now been anointed as king, and God is in the process of bringing an early end to Saul's reign. So that's where we last left off. The next significant event in Samuel's life is in chapter 25. Back in chapter 25, verse 1, we're told very simply that Samuel died. That's a pretty big event in anybody's life. And so Samuel dies. And we just get one verse of description. It tells us that he died. It tells us that all of Israel mourned for him and at his passing. And we're told where he was buried. So all of that happens, and then finally we arrive here at chapter 28. And in chapter 28, starting in verse 3, we get a summary statement about what Samuel has experienced. It says that Samuel had died. All Israel lamented for him and buried him in Ramah in his own city. All right, so we got that. Samuel is dead and buried. But then verse 3 says, Samuel put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. That Samuel put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. Well, what are and what were mediums and spiritists? Well, these individuals were called mediums because they serve as a medium or a, a one who mediates between the land of the living and the dead. These are individuals that purport to be able to communicate with those who have already crossed over from life into death. Now, going all the way back to Exodus chapter 22, God had made very clear that his people were to have nothing to do with this ilk. God had made very clear, in fact, he had been so specific as to say, you shall not let these people live among you. If they were to be found, they were to be executed. These people were to have no place among the people of God. And so Samuel has kicking, is kicking them out. That should raise a little question in your mind. Why is Saul doing this now? It could have been done years before. This could have been done on day one of his reign. Why is it not happening, or why did it not happen before? Well, hopefully we'll, we'll come up with an answer to that in a moment. By the time, though, you get to verse 4, trouble is brewing for Saul. We're told in verse 4 that the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. Shunem is very close to where Saul and the nation of Israel is, and he knows that they're not just out camping, that this is not just a great weekend for the Philistines to get together. They are gathering together because they're amassing their forces with the intent on launching some sort of military raid. Seeing this, becoming aware of this, Saul is petrified. He is scared to death. We're told 
in verse 5, when he saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. He's really scared. And he doesn't know exactly what it is that he should do. In verse 6, we're told, though, that he inquired of the Lord. Saul recognizes, I need some help. I need some guidance. I need somebody to speak truth into these circumstances so that I don't make a misstep here. And he inquires of the Lord, but it says the Lord did not answer him. In fact, first of all, it says the Lord did not answer him by dreams. So... He had hoped maybe, you know, I can go to sleep tonight and God's going to put some thought, some burden on my heart and I'll know what it is that I should do. Or he says by the, the Urim. The Urim was a, a revelatory device that was used by the Aaronic priest. And Saul has tried to use that, but that doesn't come up with anything. Or by the prophets. And so those that are part of the school of Samuel, they have nothing to be able to share with Saul to be of help. He needs some answers. He doesn't know what to do. And so in verse 7, Saul talks to his aides and he says, Guys, I need you to find me a medium. I need you to find me a spiritist, someone that I, to, uh, I can, verse 7, go to her and inquire of her. I've got to have some answers. And so their response is, you know, I think there's some lady down in the town of Endor. I, I, think, I think there's, there's one down there. So verse 8 tells us that Saul disguised himself. And so he's taken off his royal robes and uh, he's no longer looking the part of a king. The royal robes are gone. He's got his blue jeans and a t-shirt on. He's got a baseball cap. Probably gets some dirt and smudges in his face. That he doesn't look like anybody special. He wants to look completely ordinary and somebody that wouldn't arrest or arouse any attention from any Body that may see him pass by. And with this disguised appearance, he makes his way and travels to the town of Endor. He finds this woman, this medium, this witch who is there. And in verse 8, he asks her a question. He says, Please conduct a seance for me and bring up for me the one I shall name for you. And the woman, hearing this request, says, well, well, wait a minute, time, time out, sir. You know, I appreciate that you think that I have the ability to help you with this. And, you know, it's nice that you've traveled here and that my reputation somehow precedes me. But, uh, yeah, I just want to remind you, the king has put us out of the kingdom. We have been outlawed. And if word gets out that I'm doing any of this, uh, this hocus pocus, uh, it, it, it's going to be lights out for me. And I, I'm not willing to be in full privy to some, or full pray to some type of trap that you're setting for me, you know, it's not worth my life. And Saul tells her, listen, I promise you, no harm, no harm is going to come to you. She says, oh, okay, who do you want me to bring up? And Saul says, I want you to bring up Samuel. I want you to bring up Samuel. Verse 12 begins with this statement, when the woman saw Samuel. Now, three chapters ago, we were told Samuel died. Verse 3 says, Samuel died. This woman saw Samuel. So you say, wait a minute. What's going on here? I mean, what, what kind of category am I to put this in? Well, what, what am I supposed to do with this? I mean, is this actually legitimate? Is this some sort of... Nonsense that somehow crept its way into the pages of Scripture. How does this gel with the whole of this? What am I supposed to do with all of this? Well, keep in mind a few things. First of all, mediums and spiritists and sorcerers and wizards and witches, all of this has been declared off-limits for the people of God emphatically in the pages of Scripture. God has been consistent about this, that, that this stuff has no place in the life of someone that professes to follow God. It's not to be at all a part of our lives. Now, that being said, you can watch a show on TV called Long Island Medium. You may, uh, there, there's a, a place over off, of, I think of Pomona. It's, uh, it's, it's got a big neon hand in, in the window. I don't know, it's Madam Witchy Buru or something like that. You can... You can go over there. I don't know. She may offer a discount with a church bulletin. I have no idea. But you could go to one of these places and consult one of these individuals and 
I believe sincerely that the majority of these are absolute frauds and charlatans. And the only thing they're really good at is getting some money out of your pocket. And uh, the, uh, the, that, that's their primary goal. All right. So I, I do believe that there are plenty of these individuals purporting these and presenting to have these abilities that are frauds and charlatans. Now that being said, do not kid yourself. Do not deceive yourself. If this Bible is correct, that there is a God who exists, then you must believe that this same Bible that tells us that there's a God who exists, that there's a devil who exists. I mean, they come as a pair. If there is, according to the pages of Scripture, a God who is in heaven, then there is a devil who is roaming this earth, and he is not alone. This same Bible tells us that he has those that are doing his bidding, that are assisting him in the form of demons. Beyond that, the Bible makes very plain and very clear that this real devil who has real demons possesses real and enormous power. It is not power that is equivalent to the power of God, but it is far greater than the power that you have far greater than the power that I have. And I believe that there are those, and there have been throughout the course of history, individuals who intentionally seek to tap into and to hook up to this demonic power. So you're saying, Michael, are you saying to me that this is legitimate, that this actually happened? Are you saying to me that, that, that God somehow gave a deceased Samuel the ability to communicate back to a living Saul? Is this, did this actually happen? Well, there, there's a couple of things that we need to be clear about. First of all, God has been very clear. Though this passage is presented to us, this is forbidden, forbidden behavior for the people of God. God's clear about that. What I believe His Word is also clear about is that this woman who is tapping into demonic power, who is availing herself of demonic power, God permits her to communicate with a dead Samuel. Now, why do I say that? Because the text is very straightforward. It doesn't present it as anything other than it happened this way. Notice what happens. Verse 8 concludes where Saul says, Please conduct a seance for me and bring up the one I shall name to you. All right? Verse 11 says, Whom shall I bring up? Saul says in verse 11, Bring up Samuel for me. Notice how verse 12 begins. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. I don't know if this woman has ever been successful any other time before, but she sees Samuel. And the only explanation that, and the, the, the reason that I say that this actually happened is she's scared. This causes her to cry out. And then and maybe this is the first time something like this has ever happened. But she sees this prophet who has died. She cries out and then she gives a description. She tells Saul. And what does Saul do? Verse 14, Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. <clears throat> The only explanation that we can have as to why they respond in this way very simply is that it happened just as the Bible tells us. This woman who is doing something that God forbade. Now, God didn't say that it is, that it is impossible. God did not say that these individuals do not and are not tapping into demonic power. He just said God's people ought not be a part of this. But this woman does so and she contacts this Samuel who has already died so much that it scares her and causes Saul to fall on his face. I don't know what else we can do with this. So through this medium... Saul's got somebody he can talk to. He's needing some help. He's needing some guidance. But Samuel's got a word for him. Verse 16, he says, Why do you ask me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? I, I can't help you. You have made, by your own choices, yourself to be an enemy of God. 
And then Samuel continues and says, Oh, by the way, you and your sons will join me tomorrow. We can, we can just do this face-to-face tomorrow. We won't need a medium. Because you and your boys, you're going to die tomorrow. Saul hears this. We're told that he, he falls down, maybe even passes out. We're told that he was physically exhausted, that he'd not had anything to eat. And to hear, hey, tomorrow it's lights out for you, that tends to have an effect on you. So that, that, that's our story. That's what the text tells us. And so you hear that and you say, well, Michael, I, I appreciate that. I have, um, some of you may say, you know, it's been a long time since I've heard that or I've never heard actually a sermon on that. So, you know, I kind of appreciate that. Some of you may say, I didn't know this stuff was in the Bible. I mean, some witch in indoor talking to a dead Samuel, to this medium, I, I had no idea this stuff was here. So, you know, I appreciate you leading me to what I have thought was a fairly obscure passage that, you know, lets me in on something that um, I wasn't aware of. But in either case, you know, I'm not talking to a witch. I'm not talking to a medium. I'm not getting my palm read. So um, what, what really does this have to do with me? What does this have to do with me and my circumstances, my own life, and walk with the Lord? Well, let me frame this up for you again. Saul, by and because of his own choices, has distanced himself from God. Saul has decided, I can obey what I want from God whenever it is convenient for me, and that'll be sufficient. God will be okay with that. You ever done that? Sure, to varying degrees, we all have. For some of you, that may be going on right now. That may be the current state of affairs between you and God, that you can do kind of what you want, taking from, from here what God has said to obey. And you'll, you'll do some of it, and just because you're doing some of it, think that God's going to be okay. Well, if and when we get to that point, understand this. There's a separation that begins to exist between you and God. And it's not a separation that God causes. It's a separation that my choices and your choices create. Circumstances will then come to bear over time that become increasingly averse or adverse. And you're going to be with your back against the wall, and you're going to be saying, you know, I really need God's help. I need God to intervene and speak to me and speak to my circumstances. i got to have the, a way out of this. I don't know how to navigate this. I don't know which end is up. I need the help of God, and God's guidance will be conspicuously absent. You can get to points and places and circumstances where the very help from God that you need is not found. That you're calling out to heaven and God is to you as he was to Saul, silent. And when that happens, you may find yourself, though not perhaps going to some sorceress or medium, grasping at straws grasping for anything that might change, bring some type of relief to bear in what you're facing. Maybe you're there right now. So what do we do with this? What's, what's the takeaway? Well, based on what we see here, I, I want to leave you with just a few simple, practical truths. And the first is this. Your public life matters. Your public life matters. Back in verse 3... <clears throat> Saul does something really good. He kicks the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. He sends them packing. And the only thing ultimately that you can say about this, this was good. It was a good thing. God said these people had no place among the people of God in the first place, so it is good that he kicked them out. But again, we're left the question, why, why not sooner? Saul could have signed this decree on his first day as king. These people had been around for years. Why, why didn't he do something before? Why, why, why is it that he's doing this now? Well, notice when it occurs. Verse 3 says, When Samuel had died and had been buried, then Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. Well, the, the text doesn't tell us, and all we can do, I suppose, is infer, but my, in my estimation, 
Saul is thinking, you know what, this would be a good gesture to God and a good demonstration of the people. Samuel, the respected, known, valued, honored prophet is now gone. And so I will do this, and this will demonstrate to God, you know, that Samuel, that guy that you sent us, he was a good dude, and he did good things, and as a tribute, as an honor, as a memorial to him, I'm going to do this. And beyond that, the people will think positively of me as well. Because they know these people should have never been among us in the first place. So he does this. Well, maybe there was some other reason that motivated Saul's choice, but regardless what he did, that act was good, and it was done publicly. Everyone knew about this. Now, I understand, and I get the point, and and regularly we hear and we say things like this, that there are individuals who are just doing good in front of others so that others may see and that others may take note and that others may may praise them for the things that they do. And so that, that, that's the only reason that they're doing these things. And we, we wag our fingers at them and we look down in our nose because they're just doing that because everybody is watching. Listen, I get that thought. I understand that thought. But we have got to get this thought settled in our mind. Your public life does matter. What you do in front of other people, it emphatically does matter. And for those of us who profess to follow the Lord before other people, we ought to be doing good things, period. I mean, Jesus could not have been more plain than he was in Matthew chapter 5 where he says, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Where are you to do those good deeds? In front of others. Now, obviously, Jesus is giving us the proper... Uh, motivation for this so that others may see those good deeds and that may point them to the giver of good deeds and the one who is ultimately good. But regardless, God expects us as those who profess to follow him to be doing good things. Why? Because your public life matters. That leads us to a second application. What you do in private matters more. Your public life matters, but what you do in private matters more more. There were, I am sure, slews of Israelites who thought, you know, that Saul, he's really taken this following God thing seriously. You know, Samuel, the prophet, the one that has really been our religious example to look to and to pay attention to for decades, he's dead and gone. And in his absence, look at Saul. I mean, it took some guts and some courage to do something like this because there were plenty of people going to these mediums and spiritists and removing them. You know, that that took some guts. You know, this Saul must really be serious about this whole following God thing. He must really be serious about being a, a follower of the Lord and taking what God has said seriously. That's who he was, or that was a conclusion that people would have arrived at based on what? What he did publicly. Now, that's what everyone else saw. That's what everyone else was able to recognize. But when the curtain was pulled back, what is Saul doing? He's getting his kingly robes off, getting his blue jeans and his t-shirt on, putting his hat on backwards so that he can head in the dead of night to go see one of these same people that he's just kicked out of the land. Publicly, he was doing good. Publicly, he was doing the right. But privately, privately, he was engaging in the same behaviors that he had put off. You say, well, that that was then. How about now? Does the name Ted Haggart ring a bell? Ted Haggart was pastor of one of the largest churches in this country, served as president of the National Association of Evangelicals, a significant lobbying voice standing for and articulating biblical values, standing for traditional marriage and biblical sexuality. In private, however, it became disclosed that he was paying a male prostitute for sexual trysts paying him to get crystal meth for his own personal use. That's who he was in private. And what you do in private matters far more than what you ever do publicly. Why? 
because private corruption pollutes and sullies public good every single time. Why do I say that? Because any time today that the name Ted Haggard is mentioned, people are not saying, you remember that good sermon that Ted preached that time? Nobody's talking about the good things that he did. Nobody's talking about the positive statements that he made. They're talking about Ted with the prostitutes and the crystal meth. Why? Yeah, your public life matters, but your private life matters even more. There's, there's a final application, which is this. Dirty hearts produce deafening silence. Dirty hearts produce deafening silence. Saul's in a pinch. Stretched out before Israel is a real and imposing enemy in the form of the Philistines. He knows that he needs God's help and he is desperate for the guidance of God. And he sought to pursue it, but God's not giving him a dream. He's not giving to him a vision. He's not working in his life through the Urim. He's not using any of the other prophets. He is hearing from God what? Nothing. Nothing. Well, why? Why? If it's not because of who and what Saul is publicly. Publicly, he's a guy that presents himself and purports to be somebody that stands for the standards of God. God has said this shouldn't be among us, and so I'm getting all that trash out of this kingdom. It's because of who he is privately. Because privately, he's engaged in the very behavior that he has publicly denounced. In his heart, he's a person who has decided that his personal satisfaction is more important than pleasing God. When the curtain has been pulled back on his heart, he decided that his ways were actually better than God's ways. And hear me in this. God would not tolerate that from Saul. And he will not tolerate it from me. And he will not tolerate it from you. As this chapter begins, Saul is scrambling. He's grasping at straws. He needs help. He needs God to speak to his circumstances. And what does he get from God? A big fat nothing. Nothing. Let me remind you of something shared by another prophet, Isaiah, in chapter 55 of his book. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. What I'm getting ready to say, you may find to be a troubling statement. It is nevertheless, I believe, a biblical presentation. A biblical presentation of how God presents himself to us. He presents himself to us and is one who is long-suffering and patient with us. Very long-suffering and very patient. And he waits on us. And a lot of times he waits on us time and time and time and time again. I mean, you want proof of that? How many lightning bolts did God send your way this week for your disobedience? Well, none. You're still here this morning. Why? Because God is long-suffering and patient. That's true. But it's also true this. Long-suffering and patience does not suggest that he or anyone will wait forever. Patience eventually runs out. Long-suffering eventually ends. God had been so abundantly patient with Saul, and he had given him chance after chance after chance after chance. In fact, when Saul first decided, you know what, I can kind of do what I want, when I want, how I want, God brought some consequences to bear where... A dynasty was not going to come from him. That, that was a, a marked consequence, but Saul still thought, you know, I get that. But you know, I can still do what I want and, and kind of a lot of what God says, but not actually fully obey him, and God will be okay with that. 
And then God informs him that his kingdom is going to come to an end. And he still thinks, you know, I, I can still do what I want, when I want, how I want, and God's going to be okay with that. And when my back is against the wall, I can call out to him. Even though before and on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't appeal to him and to his guidance, to his wisdom, for his grace, for a relationship, even though I appeal to nothing of that, when my back gets against the wall, then I can ring him up and say, Oh God, I need your help. And he's going to say, What do you need? And what did he get? Silence. Nothing. God, I need you. I've got to have your help. I've got to have you speak into my circumstances. My back is against the wall. I've got an enemy army that's getting ready to pounce on us. And I don't know what to do. Please, God, help me. And God says what? Nothing. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. I believe that the picture that the Bible presents for us is of a patient, long-suffering God, yet a patient and long-suffering God who will not wait forever. And eventually we get to the point where He is not near. Eventually we call out and get to a point where He by us cannot be found. And it's not because of God doing something. It's because of what we do. Why this happened for Saul? It's because of what he did. What he so desperately needed was help and for God to speak to him. And what did he get? Absolute silence from God. Let me ask you this. Is God saying anything to you? Is your Bible ever open long enough that God causes something on these pages to be illumined by His Spirit to speak to your circumstances? Do you ever get still, a long, still enough, long enough, quiet enough that the Spirit of God speaks to you, guides you, prompts you with something? More importantly, even if you were to do those things, to open up your Bible long enough, to get still enough and quiet enough, long enough, would, would He be saying anything at all to you? After all, dirty hearts... Produce something from God. And that something is a deafening, deafening silence. In the life of so many believers, though, and pastors are no exclusion, we are constantly pursuing the next new and greatest thing. You know, pastors are going to conferences and reading books and trying to discover the latest strategies and the newest demographic information, all with the hope that somehow that's going to speak to our circumstances so that the churches that we're called to lead might uh, experience radical, amazing, and booming growth and just amazing things. Pastors do this. Professing followers of Christ head to the nearest Lifeway store so that they can get the newest book. We want to take advantage of the newest class that's being offered. Make it a point to take advantage of retreats that are made possible. We want to go to this conference and that conference. So we want to see all of these and take advantage of all of these newest, latest, and greatest opportunities with the hope and the expectation that God might do something in our circumstance. Hear me in this. God can speak to me and to you through one of these avenues. He can God can speak to you at a conference. He can speak to you at some book that, and speak to you through some book that you pick up at the bookstore. That's possible. It really is. And, and don't misunderstand me in that. But also hear me in this. None of that's necessary. None of that's necessary. You don't need another new book. This old one will do. You don't need another new class. You don't need another conference. You don't need a seminar. You don't need a motivational speaker. One thing is necessary. You know what that one thing is if you want to hear from God? A clean heart. A clean heart. Let me leave you with the words of a guy who defines, who exemplifies consistent living for and with the Lord. A guy that God spoke to a guy that God spoke through, a guy that God used back in this day and, quite frankly, is still using him today. They're the words of Samuel back in chapter 15. Very simply, they see this, say this, 
Does the Lord have as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying His voice? To obey is better than to sacrifice. You want a relationship with a God that is vital, that is exuberant, that is meaningful, that is impacting? One where when you need Him, you find Him. One where you call out to Him and He speaks. That happens when you and I have a walk with Him that is marked, as Samuel's life was marked, by obedience. Because dirty hearts always produce deafening silence. God is looking to make consistent followers today just as he did with Samuel. And it requires a single yet essential ingredient, and that ingredient is this, obedience. He's looking for him. Does he find that today in you? Will you bow your heads with me? Lord, in all likelihood, there are some folks here today who can say and are thinking right now, um, it's been so long since I felt God speaking to me, I don't even remember what that was like. I've been trying to make good choices and prudent choices and wise choices, and I talk to other people and I read books and I do all of these things, but... You know, honestly, I don't remember the last time I felt like I could say that, that God was speaking to me. And Lord, you, through the power of your Spirit, are helping them to see that there is a reason for that. It's the same reason as it was for Saul. Dirty hearts produce from you a deafening silence. You don't speak to hearts that are unwilling to be clean before you. Lord, you can show us what is in our hearts in ways that nothing else and no one else ever could. And there are perhaps more than a few here today that you are showing some things about themselves to them. And you're doing so because you want things to change. You can, at this point, still be found. You are still near. There is still, at this point, opportunity. I pray, God, that you help us to realize opportunity doesn't last forever. Your patience does end and your long-suffering does have a limit. It did for Saul, it will for me, it will for all of us. Lord, you have and you can speak and have spoken in ways today that I, I, I can't fully imagine what they could be in ways in which they are. I just believe that you've spoken. Some you're calling back close to you to make choices that begin to bring about consistent living for you. Others maybe to find out how they can have a relationship with you or others to become or find out how they can be part, become part of this church family. Some burden that's on our heart that you want us to just leave. Leave with you. Or there are some that need to come and want and you're prompting them to just kneel at this altar and have an honest, candid conversation with you. Others to have that same conversation right where they are. I just believe, Lord, that you have and you continue as you always do to speak through your word. And as you speak, you always call for a decision and we've got a chance to make those decisions today. And I pray, God, that we seize this time for our personal good, but far more for your pleasure. We commit this time to you in Christ's name. Amen. As God has spoken to you today, you've got a chance to respond. You want somebody to pray with you, we'll be glad to. You want to just kneel at this altar, this place is open. Whatever God is saying to you, you've got a chance. Call on him while he is near. Experience him while he can still be found. This is your opportunity. My prayer is you'll seize it. We stand as our praise team leads us in the hymn of invitation.